so the way in which, uh, let me say one final thing, Mr. Hyde is presented, or rather Dr. Jekyll, is presented as entirely rational, respectable. He's a civilized Victorian gentleman. Got the top hat. He is a, he is a doctor. To this day, if you're a doctor, there's a certain, certain reverence that is attributed to that. Oh, my son's a doctor. I want, and he, oh, he wants to be, and parents are proud. Um, so he is the essence of respectability. He represents, however, the ideal of the rational man, civilized. He is the ultimate in civilization. And his opposite, Dr. Jekyll, is the, is the exact opposite. It is a variation on Swift's modest proposal. There's the respectable Protestants that represents the order, the establishment, and then there's the entirely contemptuous, disgusting uh, Catholic minority, which is threatening to become a majority because of their habits of producing children and begging and stealing and committing abortions and etc. and having births outside marriage and so forth. There's a, a critique there going on. And now it's come in, but note that in both cases it's reason against a sort of nature that is not acting very, it's not behaving well. And the solution for Dr. Jekyll is to try and control that nature through science through, in this case, an injection. He's trying to pro solve the problem of human sin through medication. Does he succeed? Clearly not, if you've read the story. Is that not what's going on in Canada in 2023? Is modern science trying to solve all the problems of, of human sinfulness through medication? by letting the scientists determine human life, by trusting science to do what's best. I think Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, uh, gives us grounds to at least critique the approach, not because we distrust the scientists per se, but because we have a certain view of human nature, which, or they have a certain view of human nature, which we think does not meet the entire body of evidence that we observe about human nature, which is, that we are actually sinners. I think it's the one indisputable doctrine of Christianity, empirically verifiable at any rate, that people are sinners. It's the only thing that explains the Mr. Hydes of the world, which are in each of us. I'm not saying we, we go around killing everybody, but how we do things that seem to contradict who we normally are, which is why we still use the, you know, the Jekyll and Hyde. Note that what is brilliant about Stevenson's portrait here, and which suggests to me that he has a Christian awareness of what's going on, is this is the same person. These are not two people, this is the same person. And modern science and the injections he uses can't control the sinful human nature in him. And in fact, the more he does so, and the more he attempts to, the, the more he fails. Different problems arise, and then he ends up having to cover for himself, and then more crimes emerge. And eventually he runs out of the concoction he needs to inject himself. He gets a purer form of it and realizes actually there was a trace mineral in the original injection, which he didn't know about, and he doesn't have that, and he ends up being totally Mr. Hyde. He can't go back to Dr. Jekyll. And he partly hints at that early in the novel when he bequeaths his entire estate to Mr. Hyde. And we think, why would this respectable doctor, this Victorian gentleman, give his estate to this horrible man who's not only uh, morally reprehensible, he's a killer. And the, the uh, an original hypothesis, I'll, I'll get to the way it's portrayed right now, is that he must be being blackmailed. Like this bad man must somehow be forcing the good man to do his will. We have no 
hint, if we've never read the story or seen the movie, that Mr. Hyde is Dr. Jekyll. And that's because he tries to hide it. So again, Stevenson is saying through this whole portrait that this is what modern science tries to do. And what it ends up doing is covering its own tracks, which simply makes the contagion worse and worse until the point in which it can no longer be hidden that the scientists who've been trying to protect us from the dark sides of human nature are actually exhibiting the dark sides of human nature in denying their own sin. Does this make any sense? The doctrine of original sin and the claim that Christians are, or rather human beings, are sinners is essential to the church. It's also essential to a correct assessment of human nature. It is empirically verifiable. However, the, if you come at it from a Cartesian perspective on human nature, as I say, you're going to systematically, categorically exclude the possibility of sin because it doesn't fit. Sin is irrational. It doesn't fit. Right. Does that mean it doesn't exist? Or does it mean that your view of human nature was fraudulent or rather deceptive from the beginning and it ought to be discarded? I'm in the latter camp in case it's all not obvious. And, and for this reason, I think that the humanities, at least the Christian take on the humanities, is very important uh, to the church today, society in general, because we are dealing with certain, quite frankly, uh, fraudulent views of human nature, and we should know better. Jesus has a rational nature. That's what the earlier church says. If you, go to, if you go to the Council of Chalcedon, so the last of the great ecumenical councils, it talks about Jesus being fully human and fully divine. And it talks about him having a rational nature. The Enlightenment also says we have a, have a rational nature, but it detaches our rational nature from having a body. Whereas Christian doctrine says, no, it's both and. And I already talked to you about Romans 12, 1 and 2. Offer up your body as, as a living sacrifice, for this is your spiritual act of worship. And then you're to no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So there's a mind, there's a body. Both of them are part of your nature. In Descartes, the body isn't a part of your nature, or rather it is a part of your nature which is detached from it. It's a return of a sort of a Gnostic view of human nature. If you remember this from your theology classes, do you know what I mean by a Gnostic view of human nature? We had enough of that yet in your classes? To, okay, if I need to explain, I'm happy to do that. But it is, it is essentially not far from Descartes' view of a ghost in a machine, except it has the one addition that we are, that the body's like a prison house. But remember, Wordsworth even used that language in his immortality ode. We're acting like prisoners when there's a free being inside of us. Why do we enslave ourselves to the pattern of this world, imitating everything around us, when really there's a free being in us, connected to nature? Let's go back to nature. By that, go back to that sense of ourselves that is pre-rational, uncivilized, good, and holy sort of priest to us. This is another take on it. And the transformation, a quote from the novel, great God, can it be? Here's Dr. Jekyll standing upright. There's Mr. Hyde. And here is the uh, figure he is confronting, which is none other than Gabriel John Utterson. Let me come to that and skip over this. And I'll put the text up on the So the, here, here's the plot line for it. 
I've already, I, I mean, from the, I, I sort of did things in reverse. I gave you the analysis before dealing with the plot. I think it's actually helpful. Once you see that, then you come to the plot and you can see that this is the interplay that Stevenson's in, in fact working with. So Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, also following a very uh, established type, the lawyer is also a rational man. He represents goodness, the law. He's there to try and ensure that the goodness in society is preserved. And he's going to follow the rules, as it were. What will he do in, in his encounter with Dr. Jekyll? Well, Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, was a man of a rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile. Very severe man. Cold, scanty, and embarrassed in discourse, backward in sentiment, lean, long, dusty, dreary, and yet somehow lovable. At friendly meetings, and when the wine was to his taste, something eminently human beaconed from his eye, <laughs> only when he had enough wine, something indeed which never found its way into his talk, but which spoke not only in these silent symbols of the after-dinner face, but more often and loudly in the acts of his life. He was austere with himself, drank gin when he was alone to mortify a taste for vintages. So he drank gin so that he wouldn't uh, indulge his love of wine too much, <laughs> I think. And there's something, Stevenson's finding this rather funny. Uh, the, the Wesleyans in the 18th century dealt with the problem of gin, and, and, uh, uh, which is uh, taking, uh, well, you know what gin is. And, and gin factories, which uh, are, is a much stronger form of alcohol. So he uses a stronger form of alcohol to address the problem of his love of a weaker form of alcohol. Again, this is symbolic of what Dr. Jekyll will, will do with Mr. Hyde as well. So he's avoiding one poison, and actually he's indulging in a far more virulent poison. And though he enjoyed the theater, had never crossed the doors of one for almost 20 years. But he had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering, almost with envy, at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds, and in any extremity inclined to help rather than to reprove. I incline to Cain's heresy, he used to say quaintly. I let my brother go to the devil in his own way. Was that Cain's heresy? To let his brother go to the devil in his own way? What did Cain do to his brother Abel? He killed him. He murdered him. I, is that what he means by this? No. I inclined to Cain's her heresy. I let my brother go to the devil in his own way. I, I don't kill my brother. I just let him kill himself. There's deep irony in the language of Stevenson here right at the outset. And the, ir the irony is satirizing the character of the lawyer Utterson as well. So we're not given a, what we would like in a novel, which is a character that we can regard as heroic or as trustworthy. Even the lawyer from the outset is being satirized. He has a certain demeanor. He deals with his, uh, his love of wine by drinking gin. He deals with, his, with the ills of society uh, by letting people act wickedly and doesn't understand Christian theology even when he says this or even can't read scripture very carefully. In this character, it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of downgoing men. So he, he would be hanging around people that were disreputable long after everyone else had dissociated themselves from those individuals. In other words, there was something Christian in his character in the sense that he hung around with the criminals and the miscasts, the outcasts. But the, the motivation is not Christian in Utterson's part. It seems rather that he 
likes being around people that are a little bit corrupt and holds himself to be different than that. They're, he's not corrupt. He doesn't intervene, doesn't try and stop it. He likes bad company. And to such as these, the lives, the downgoing men, so long as they came about his chambers, he never marked a shade of change in his demeanor. So as long as they approach him in, uh, in private and not in public, he's happy to accept them. So he is leading, he's a hypocrite. He's leading a double life as well. He will be a Dr. Jekyll character himself. So there are two ways. So again, and, and Utterson is going to be drawn into, a, into this whole matter in this fashion. No doubt the feat was easy for Mr. Utterson, for he was undemonstrative at the best, and even his friendship seemed to be founded in a similar catholicity of good nature. It is the mark of a modest man to accept his friendly circle ready-made from the hands of opportunity. And that was the lawyer's way. His friends were those of his own blood, or those whom he had known the longest. His affections, like ivy, were the growth of time. They implied no aptness in the subject, in the object. In other words, he was, had an undiscriminating character, poor judgment, and he just hung around the people who he hung around with. They just happened to be near him. He didn't make judgments. He didn't make value judgments. He was a man without a chest, what Lewis would call as a man without a chest in the abolition of man. Didn't judge anyone. Not trustworthy at all, actually. Hence, no doubt, the bond that united to him to Mr. Rich, Richard Enfield, his distant kinsman, the well-known man about town. It was a nut to crack for many what these two could see in each other or what subject they could find in common. Well, what do they have in common? They have a nature. They're blood relatives, that's it. What do they have in common? The one is an entirely respectable lawyer, the other is, my goodness, a, dis a, a disreputable individual. So right from the outset, Stevenson is extending his critique of Dr. Jekyll to the establishment and including the lawyers alongside the doctors. Um, they go about on Sunday walks and they encounter, or rather, Utterson tells a story, or Enfield tells the story, of a event that happened months ago. Three o'clock in the morning. What's he doing out at three o'clock in the morning? What gentleman, what respectable man is out at three in the morning? What on earth is he doing? Well, he's not being very reputable, that's for sure. And he, and he happens to see a sinister looking man called Edward Hyde. Well, let me just read the story here. It was this way, returned Enfield. I was coming home from some place at the end of the world, about three o'clock of a black winter morning, and my way lay through a part of town where there was literally nothing to be seen but lamps. Street after street and all the folks asleep. Street after street, all lighted up as if for a procession and all as empty as a church. Till at last I got into that state of mind when a man listens and listens and begins to long for the sight of a policeman. All at once I saw two figures, one a little man who was stumping along eastward at a good walk, the other a girl of maybe eight or ten who was running as hard as she was able down across street. Well, sir, the two ran into one another naturally enough at the corner. So one's coming this direction, the other's coming this direction, they don't see each other, and bang. And then came the horrible part of the thing. For the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man. It was like some damned juggernaut. I gave a few hello, took to my heels, collared my gentleman, and brought him back to there where there was already quite a group about 
the screaming child, he was perfectly cool and made no resistance, but gave me one look so ugly that it brought out the sweat on me like running. The people who had turned out were the girl's own family, and pretty soon the doctor for whom she had been sent put in his appearance. Well, the child was no much the worse, more frightened according to the saw bones, that is the doctor, because doctors who are surgeons at the time would, or were often also barbers by the, the way, they'd saw off limbs. The doctors called the saw bones. And there you might have supposed there would be an end to it, but there was one curious circumstance. I had taken a loathing to my gentleman at first sight. So had the child's family which was only natural. But the doctor's case was what struck me. He was the unusual cut and dry apothecary of no particular age and color with a strong Edinburgh accent and about as emotional as a bagpipe. Well, sir, he was like the rest of us. Every time he looked at my prisoner, I saw that sawbones, sawbones turned sick and white with desire to kill him. I knew what was in his mind, just as he knew what was in mine. And killing, being out of the question, we did the next best. We told the man we, we, we could and would make such a scandal out of this as should make his name stink from one end of London to the other. If he had any friends or any credit, we undertook that he should lose them. And what does he say? And he could say to this man sitting in the middle with a black sneering face, coolness, carrying it off, sir, really like Satan. If you choose to make capital out of this accident, said he, I am naturally helpless. You want to make money from this accident? No gentleman but wishes to avoid a scene, says he, name your figure. Well, we screwed him up to 100 pounds for the child's family. He would have clearly liked to stick out, but there was something about the lot of us that meant mischief, and at last he struck. The next thing was to get the money, and where do you think he carried us but to that place with the door, which the two of them have just come across and seen somebody flying out of, whipped out a key, went in, presently came back with a matter of 10 pounds in gold and a check for the balance on, on couts, drawn payable to bearer and signed with a name that I can't mention. Dr. Jekyll. Though it's one of the points of my story. But it was a name at least very well known and often printed. The figure was stiff, but the signature was good for more than that if it was only genuine. I took the liberty of pointing out to my gentleman that the whole business looked apocryphal. And that a man does not in real life walk into a cellar door at four in the morning and come out with another man's check for close upon a hundred pounds, but he was quite easy and sneering. Set your mind at rest, says he, I will stay with you till the banks open and cash the check myself. It's already obvious who this is. So we all set off, the doctor and the child's father and our friend and myself and passed the rest of the night in my chambers. And next day when we had breakfasts, went in a body to the bank. I gave in the check myself and said I had every reason to believe it was a forgery. Not a bit of it. The check was genuine. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson. Okay. So what's going on here? It's obvious he signed that he, he's not going to give the name. Why is he not going to give the name? Here. Yeah. Doesn't want to bring blame upon the man who clearly is Dr. Jekyll, but he encountered him looking a lot like this guy. But at this point, Dr. Jekyll is still able to speak in the fashion. He's, he's closer to the man who's upright than the man who's down. As the story progresses, Dr. Jekyll becomes more Mr. Hyde-like because at the point now he's just paying off and, and he's able to um, deal with the situation through, his, through the fact that he's Dr. Jekyll. But, but uh, Enfield does not want to reveal to Utterson who he is. In other words, it's a cover-up. He's, he's complicit in the problem here. 
right? And why does he not want to do so? Because he doesn't want to sully the reputation of a very respected doctor. We don't want to criticize a doctor. Now, Utterson, by the way, it's not revealed here that it is Dr. Jekyll, but it ought to be just from the facts of the case uh, that we know that thus far. It will be revealed a little bit later on. But Utterson fears that H Hyde is blackmailing Jekyll because, of course, what else is he going to think? You've described one man that goes in. The place that we just passed, the door, is connected to the offices of Dr. Jekyll. And so, therefore, something is going on here. And because Jekyll has recently changed his will, as it turns out, to make Hyde the sole beneficiary in the case that Jekyll dies or, or simply disappears, which is a funny old thing to do with your will. Breeds suspicion. Why on earth would anyone ever change their will in the case of my death or simply disappearance? Give my estate to this man who appears to have no connection to me and as far as I appear to be respectable is the least respectable person that you would know. What could explain such a thing? Blackmail. When Utterson, a little bit later on, tries to discuss Hyde with Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll says, it's not so. It's not blackmail. I can get rid of Hyde whenever I want. Just drop it. Don't worry about it. It's, it's not what you think. He is not blackmailing me. I can take care of him. In other words, what we will soon know is that he thinks that the medicine can control Mr. Hyde, the sinful person that he, we saw right here in the story of the trampling of the child, can be controlled through medication. It's the scientist thinking that he has control of himself and his nature. Because again, he sees his nature not as sinful, but rather as he has a certain metabolic issue, perhaps. Now, a year later, in the story. I'm going to have to skip over some of this. and I can't go through the whole novel just uh, bit by bit. Um, they're going to search for Mr. Hyde and so forth. But a year later in October, a servant sees Mr. Hyde once again. And this time, he sees him beat a man. And the man this time is an arist aristocrat. He's not a child, but a, an aristocrat by the name of Sir Danvers Carew, who's another client of the lawyer Utterson. He beats him to death. He doesn't just beat him, he kills him and breaks his cane. Because it's his, he's the lawyer and uh, Carew is his client, the police come to Utterson. So they come to him and what does he do? I know where Dr. Hyde lives and he goes to the door where he knows Hyde is and in there, they don't find Dr. Hyde, but what did they find? The other half of the broken cane. So it, it, it's clearly evidence that Dr. Hyde was the killer. It sounded like him, and here's the evidence, the other half of the broken cane is right here. You hit, the cane, hit him with the cane, the cane broke, the man died, and here's the evidence. If they had fingerprints at the time, they would have found his fingerprints all over it, doubtless as well. And Utterson, further, and I'm not going to be able to find this in the text now, but Utterson recognizes that he had given that cane to Dr. To Dr. Jekyll. Ah, so it's a stolen cane. Not only did he kill somebody, he stole the cane. Now, these are false conclusions. Why are they seized upon? Because he can't possibly bring himself to think that it could be Dr. Jekyll. He's respectable, he's good, he's moral, he's part of the establishment. He behaves in a certain way in public. We've already seen from the outset that Robert Louis Stevenson, the novelist, is telling us 
even in the case of Utterson, the lawyer, that the way he acts in public is very different than the way he acts in private. He drinks gin to deal with his problem of loving wine too much. He hangs out with disrespectable people because he lacks all judgment. So there's a veneer of civilization on the surface that actually prevents them from seeing what is clearly going on here, which is that a man has given in to his sin, done atrocities, committed them, tried to cover them up, and everybody else is going to help him cover up. Because it couldn't possibly be a doctor that would do this. It couldn't possibly be a pastor who would commit atrocities, right? Respectable people. There's a certain sense. This can't be so. We, I don't want to believe it. Every time respectable members of the establishment commit certain acts, um, it's very difficult for other people to accept that. And that's because, again, they want to exclude the category of human nature or the ex explanation of human nature that the Bible presents to us, which is that we're sinners. So when we do sinful things, we're acting in accordance with our nature. Further problem, and again, this should, this should tip it off. Utterson visits Jekyll. So he, he finds him, he visits him, and he produces a note allegedly written to him, uh, to, to Jekyll, uh, by Mr. Hyde. So he goes and, so I, I can't find Mr. Hyde. Let me go to my friend Jekyll, because you, you're in the same quarters. There's the doctor's office in the front one side, and then there's the back entrance where Mr. Hyde comes in. Again, that's sort of symbolic as well. So there's the front door and then there's the back door. You must know this man, yes. So he left a, a note and what does the note say? From Hyde, he apologizes for all the trouble he's caused. And here's the problem. Utterson notes that Dr. or rather Mr. Hyde's handwriting is very similar to Dr. Jekyll's. So what's the conclusion? Forgery! Mr. Hyde must have been forged his handwriting to look like Dr. Jekyll's. Again, the evidence is right in his face, but he won't see it in the same sense that he won't see his own sinful nature. Again, Stevenson is pushing us to, to see something that the establishment won't see, won't recognize, can't recognize. Because again, their worldview will not allow for the obvious. Time passes, two months passes, Dr. Jekyll refer, reverts back to his sociable manner, but in early January, we find that he's starting to become unsociable again, starting to become more Mr. Hyde-like, and he starts refusing visitors. Uh, one individual by the name of uh, Dr. Hasty Lanyon friend of, of Dr. Jekyll and the lawyer Utterson dies of shock when he hears about what Mr. Hyde had done. Why would you die of shock? Actually, it's not about Mr. Hyde. It's what he hears information about Dr. Jekyll. He dies. How come? He knows. Just dies suddenly. And before his death, Lanyon gives Utterson a letter to be opened. So what's in the letter? What's in the letter? Well, it, it's, he says, you, here's the letter, but you may only open it under the condition that Dr. Jekyll dies or disappears. Those are the same conditions that we saw in the will of Dr. Jekyll. In the event that I die or disappear, give my entire state to Mr. Mr. Hyde, right? Uh, Dr. Hasty Lanyon gives a letter, you will only open this if Dr. Jekyll dies or disappears. Then you can open it. And um, uh, let me see, moving on. What have I got? I only have 10 minutes, okay. Um, 
Dr. Jekyll at this point has been trying to control. Remember he said at the outset, Utterson, don't worry about Mr. Hyde, I can take care of him. It's, he's not black, mailing me. But, but the investigative uh, lawyer thinks that he's not telling the truth, that it must be the case because he has evidence that contradicts what his friend is saying to him, but he can't distrust his friend because he's respectable, he's a scientist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he behaves this way with him in public. He resolves, is it a question? No, yes? No, okay, just holding your hand. Um, Jekyll resolves, I'm not going to become Mr. Hyde anymore. I'm not gonna do it. What we find interesting here, a little twist in the tale, he doesn't become Mr. Hyde uh, He doesn't become Dr. Jekyll by drinking the serum to hold down Mr. Hyde. It's the other way around. He drinks the serum, takes the medicine to allow him to be Mr. Hyde. He allows him to indulge in his sinful desires to do bad things. I can act out of character. You know what? I want to live on the wild side a little bit. I'll take a shot drink this that, and allows me to live out my fantasies, which I'm suppressing. So twist in the tail. We thought that he was using the medication because he's a respectable doctor to keep the sinful side of himself down. It's the other way around. He takes it to allow himself to be, to uh, live out his dark fantasies. But one night he drinks in a, a moment of weakness, he drinks the serum and kills another fellow by the name of Karu. Who? The fellow we knew about, it, Dr. Uh, or uh, Sir Danvers Karu. Right? So at that point, he did it, uh, kills him, and and it's in part because he had not let his desires out for so long. He'd been two months without drinking the serum, and so he had a suppressed desire to kill people, which now he didn't just trample somebody, he went even further. So again, Stevenson is saying something here about uh, sin and our attempts to control it, or let it out when we choose to, and so forth. Comment on this. And he tries to stop the transformations more and more and more. And what we find out is that the serum that he uses to control, because he uses one to control and the other to uh, exhibit, he runs low on the serum and the element in it, as I say, that prevents um, uh, or allows him to control the situation does not work anymore. He's run short on it and he realizes that there was something in the original uh, concoction, in the medicine, that he had not, he didn't realize. So it was just a trace element. And that was actually what allowed him to control it. He doesn't know what the trace element is. And in the end, he loses total control and becomes Mr. Hyde. So it is a sort of um, nightmare scenario throughout. And, and a, it's just a story about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Or is it? What is, what is Stevenson saying about modern science? What is he saying about Victorian respectability? What is he saying about the ideal of the gentleman who can act like this in public and then when he's in the privacy of his own home indulge himself in whatever ways he sees fit? Can, can we separate the sinful side of ourselves from the rational, respectable side of ourselves? How do we do that? We try and do it through science. We try and do it through manners. We paper over, you know, you wear the white lab coat. Does that deal with the problem of human nature that Christians call sin? Looks like Stephen says, Stevenson says, absolutely not. Does nothing of the sort. You do, you're, what you're denying only becomes worse and worse and more hypocritical and it pulls in others and the contagion eventually gets out of your control.
Now, this is, you, you could use a biblical text to illustrate the same thing. David and Bathsheba. I, I, you come up with a hundred different biblical texts on this where somebody commits a sin, then tries to cover up the sin by doing something more. So David sleeps with Uriah the Hittite's wife Bathsheba. He stays home from the wars. Why does he stay from home from the wars? He's been a successful warrior king fighting the, uh, the Lord's battles on behalf of Israel. He decides to stay back home. Why does he st stay back home? Very odd thing for the king to do. He stays back home because he's probably seen Bathsheba's wife or, or Uriah the Hittite's wife. She, for her part, happens to be in full view in public. He sees her, invites her in, commits adultery with her. She has, gets pregnant. What does he do? Tells his general that when Uriah the Hittite is there fighting, by the, the uh, Hittites are not uh, Israelites. So this is somebody who is fighting for Israel, but he's not really an Israelite. So, um, but he's faithful to them and he's faithful to David. He says, when, they, when, the, when you run forward, rush in an army together in a line, just get everyone else to stand back and let him go forward. And he does and he's killed. So he's murdered him. Cover up, cover up, cover up. What happens? How is it exposed? The prophet comes to him. Gives him a story. But a little, a man who was rich, etc. And then there was another man, all he had was a little lamb. And the rich man took the little lamb from the poor man. David is furious. Wants the man who did such a thing to be killed. What does Nathan, the prophet, say? You're the man. You are the man. Same thing is happening here in a different form. It's in, a sci it's in the form of science fiction, uh, science fiction, the Gothic novel, but it's using modern science. Modern science who is the respectable public figure of a David type thing and trying to not see what he doesn't want to see. He doesn't want to see this. He can't even see it himself. He's denying it. But he judges very clearly when it's somebody there, but he can't even see it himself. This is a total exposure. Stevenson, I think, is a Christian novelist, and he is, he is talking about a category that the scientific establishment, the educational establishment, does not acknowledge, won't acknowledge, but explains everything that they see with their own eyes. By not seeing it and by coming up with ac other explanations, do they make the situation better or do they make it worse? I think they make it worse. Is it genetics that makes us do things? Is it society that makes us do things? The romantics say it's society. Is it genetics? Darwinists will say yes. Is it our brain chemistry that makes it? Again, some psychologists will say it's, it's that. By the way, it can be some of that, but the root problem is sin. And that's the one thing that's not talked about here. And, and they're gentlemen, whether they're the, the doctor or the lawyer or, or the uh, establishment, don't want to acknowledge it. Stevenson makes it clear that they can't avoid it. They're just prolonging the inevitable. And by the time you are going to admit it, there's a lot of blood on the floor. Comments or questions? It's a great little novella. Frankenstein does much of the same thing, but this one's better only in the sense that it's the man who's the scientist who's also the perpetrator of the bad thing. No, Shelley does this as well by the creature and, you know, who's the real monster here, but here that she makes, Stevenson makes them one and the same person. But that horror novel uh, in both cases is, is actually related to the thing that we most respect. That's what the horror is. The thing that's most respectable, the lawyer, the doctor, or the religious figure, because the Gothic novel is full of religious figures that do atrocities as well, is the very one who is perpetrating the crimes that we don't want to see. And I think it's a, it's a feature of 
uh, fiction from the Enlightenment period onward, we don't see it in the ancient world. We don't see it in Shakespeare. It's characteristic of the Enlightenment Cartesian view of human nature. Anyway, enough.